Hello, everyone. My name is Agata Morka, and I am SCOS coordinator. And we are here today to talk about the new SCOS strategy and the results of SCOS consultation that was um, that was made uh, earlier this summer, 2021. I am here with four panelists, and I would like to um, ask all of you to introduce yourselves and also to tell us what is your role in SCOS. Judy, I will start with you because you are first on my screen. Thank you. Hi, I'm Judy Rutenberg. I'm the Senior Director of Scholarship and Policy at the Association of Research Libraries, and I represent ARL on the SCOS board. Thank you. Susan, over to you. I'm Susan Haig. I'm Executive Director of the Canadian Association of Research Libraries. Um, I represent uh, Carl, but also uh, CRKN, our partner in the SCOS endeavor for Canada on the board of SCOS. Wonderful, thank you. Al-Walid. Hi, uh, my name is Al-Walid Al-Khaja. I'm a senior intellectual property librarian at Qatar National Library, and I represent Qatar National Library on the SCOS board. Thank you very much. And now we have John. <clears throat> Hi, uh, I'm John Treadway. I'm an independent uh, consultant and researcher, and I have been supporting SCOS in the consultation and development of the strategy since uh, earlier in 2021. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, Al-Walid, over to you. All right, so I'll be asking our uh, speakers today some questions about the strategy and SCOS in general. So the first question uh, is to Susan. Um, so SCOS has been active since 2017. Uh, can you tell us more about SCOS and uh, what has SCOS done over the past couple of years? So SCOS was formed as a as a community response to a sense that the um, open um, infrastructure, small organizations, not for profits, often uh, that may have, for, for example, started with project funding, were having um, were were um, having sustainability challenges uh, to transition their 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 support um, and to remain viable, and so the community. Um, you're uh, led by Spark Europe, uh, sort of came together to to form this this organization that basically um, is is almost like a crowdsourcing of of support uh, towards these uh, not for profit organizations. The model is very simple. It's a, it, but it's a it's pragmatic. It's effective. Um, it, the, basically, the not for profit organizations um, uh, apply to to SCOS. They um, they're vetted, um, and then they're vetted by an advisory group of experts. Uh, a few of them are then endorsed for recommendation to the community for, for potential funding. Uh, they're put out there. They have, uh, in that process, they have provided a lot of information in terms of their financial need and their uh, governance structures and, and all sorts of information. Um, they, so as I said, they're recommended and then uh, libraries uh, that are looking to invest in open infrastructure as a, as a beginning to, uh, to transition away from just investing in licensed content uh, have somewhere, you know, that is sort of preset for them to, to uh, consider. And, um, and then they can either individually invest or uh, consortially. And if they do so consortially, they end up with uh, a, a kind of discount in their relationship with the with the individual infrastructure. So, so far, SCOS has had three rounds and um, has funded uh, or is in the process of funding eight different infrastructures that are global in reach and uh, varied in their in their uh, activities. And um, uh, so far, there has been um, in dollars about three point eight eight million dollars put forward from the global uh, library community to support these infrastructures. So the, the, in the first round, the pilot cycle, it was Sherpa Romeo and DOAJ. And one of the wonderful things is the DOAJ, uh, we achieved 100 percent of the target need uh, for that. So it's a success story. It's our best success story to date, although uh, they're also 100% in the second round. So the second funding cycle, DOAB and OAPEN, as well as Open Citations and PKP, uh, all of uh, the DOAB and OAPEN achieved 100% as well of their funding goals, and uh, the others are still building. Uh, they're still out there for support. And, um, and then we have just... Uh, uh, very recently announced the the third funding cycle where we were really delighted that uh, 
uh, to announce that we have recommended archive Redelic, uh, Amalika, and uh, DSpace for this round. And so this round is just beginning. Um, uh, we're very keen to start uh, gathering funds from from across the globe. So it seems there's a lot of effort taken by SCOST in vetting and selecting uh, those, those infrastructure. Um, Judy, I was wondering if you can tell me more about the selection process and how can kind I of have more details about this? Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Susan. I, I do think it's a simple model, but I, I also want to just say congratulations to any infrastructure that has been selected and vetted by SCOST because the process is actually quite rigorous. Um, and so it is a um, there is an initial call, as Susan suggested, for expressions of interest from open, open infrastructure services. And the, there is a SCOS advisory group, which is made up of open science experts with strong policy, technical, financial um, uh, knowledge taken from, drawn from the membership of the 10 uh, SCOS member associations. Um, and they spend uh, between six and eight weeks evaluating these initial applications um, and select a maximum of six to invite to advance to the next round. So the next round is really a formal application, which as Susan suggested is a much more, uh, there's much more data gathered. Um, but they're, you know, the, what they're as it's, you know, we've, we've sort of implied in the, in the introduction to this, um, we're looking, SCOS is looking at services that are at least a year old, um, that have a demonstrated sustainability challenge, um, that are themselves nonprofits uh, or uh, owned by a research or educational institution. And SCOS does look for services that are inter broadly internationally relevant and um, broadly serve more than one discipline. So again, congratulations to the services that have come through this in particular. You know, welcome to the third round. So when the SCOS board approves that short list and um, the advisory group has a much kind of richer set of data to look through in the applications, they do select two to three services to go forward um, for funding. And again, is looking for things like uh, what the services value is to the stakeholder community. And stakeholders are broad, libraries, universities, funders, research managers, the research community itself, of course. Um, looking at the governance structure, sustainability measures, and their kind of future plans. Um, and then also just how they, how the infrastructure see that they fit within a broader, open, sustainable, fair landscape. So uh, as Susan suggested, we work with the selected services to do, to do this crowdfunding. SCOS does not collect the money. It, um, that happens between the, uh, the services and the, uh, uh, the contributors, the funding institutions and, and consortia, but uh, being selected by SCOS really means having been vetted by this global community of open science experts. And it means that the services are working to become more stable and sustainable financially, um, which again, encourages transparency, um, efficiency and, and good governance. Thanks, Judy. So sustainability is a key term in what SCOS does and what we're looking for. I mean, a question maybe for um, Judy, Susan, or and John, please uh, feel free to jump in. What can sustainability mean for open infrastructure? Um, of course, I mean, I don't know if you mentioned some, several things, but uh, what can it mean in, in, in like long term in general for open infrastructure? Maybe maybe a good place to start out with is, is a quote that we've referred to when developing the strategy because you know when people say sustainability, often they mean oh we need more money we need grant we need funding we need somebody to fund us and um, we, we have as a group referred to the sustainability mindset which is a book by Bell Masuaka and Zimmerman which is very useful and they talk about sustainability or a sustainable business model sounding like it will allow an organization to generate financial resources on an ongoing basis. And everyone can sort of sit back, oh, we've got a sustainable business model. That's it, gold chief. And, and that's not it, right? Sustainability is an orientation, it's a mindset. It's a way an organization is set up. It's not a destination that you reach. It's, um, they distinguish between two types of sustainability. So there's financial sustainability, which is kind of what most people talk about, but they, they define it as, the ability to generate resources to meet the needs of the present without compromising the future. So it's not something that's achieved and 
there you are, it's done and dusted. There is a business model that's always sustainable. It is how can you do what you need to at the present without compromising your future existence to richer conceptualization and then also programmatic sustainability. So the ability to develop and mature and cycle out programs that are responsive to constituencies, to stakeholders, to groups of customers over time. So a, an ability to grow, to develop, to invest in the next, um, the next version of your software, the ability to, to progress your offering, to respond to the needs of your customers, to respond to the community that is supporting you. It's a much, um, again, it's a much broader and richer concept that I think most people understand when you talk it through. And Scott has, uh, and maybe Susan and Judy can tell me here, it has always been interested in not just getting funds to people, but making sure those organizations can grow as part of the process, can, can demonstrate an ability to utilize funds and sustain themselves and be part of the landscape over a lengthy, longer period of time, not just their business model shows that if they get this in, it will cover their costs. It's, it's a much broader concept than that. Thanks, John. Uh, maybe this is a good way, it's a good time to talk about the strategy. So over the last couple of months, <laughs> uh, John, we've been working with you um, and uh, a strategy working group within SCOS, um, for, which includes members from the SCOS board and the advisor group. And, um, and from the beginning, uh, SCOS planned or wanted that this strategy is evidence-based. So I was hoping maybe you can tell us more about our approach to kind of understand what uh, SCOS should do in the future um, strategy-wise and what kind of techniques and tools that we've used during this process. Sure, I'm happy to. You know, for SCOS, it has a very clear community, a very clear network of organizations with whom it works, a very clear group of infrastructure providers that it's supported um, and, and, and those it hasn't, because as we've said, you know, not everyone who's applied has been successful. And so a, a, a clear and well-defined group of people to whom we wanted to speak. So the consultation had several strands. The main strand was a survey of uh, the research sector with different sections targeted at providers of open science infrastructure and institutions that pledge funds through SCOS, as well as general questions seeking to ascertain knowledge and awareness of SCOS and what it does. We supplemented that with uh, six focus groups um, and uh, about 20 semi-structured interviews with a range of individuals, uh, including, I think, some of the panelists who are speaking today, you know, board members, but also a much wider group of, of people. Um, if you look at the survey, um, it breaks down with Canada providing the highest number of respondents, France the next highest, and then a large number of European nations providing uh, a number of respondents each. You know, Europe is a long tail by definition, and that's reflected. Um, the re remaining responses were split out across other continents, Qatar, Australia, the USA, all provided a, a significant number. And um, a large, the largest number of respondents were also from university libraries, and there were a few from other libraries. We also saw um, research intensive universities well represented, open science infrastructure providers well represented, and then a broad range of other respondents from other organisations. Uh, of the respondents, a large minority, about 40%, have authority over budgets from which they can support open infrastructure. And we had um, about 45 organisations that have previously pledged funding to one of SCOS, SCOS, one or more of SCOS's selected initiatives. So a very broad range. And then we supplemented that, as I say, with focus groups and one-to-one -one interviews with people where they had expressed a particular opinion or where we wanted to dig more deeply. But I'm going to talk here in, in, in detail about some of the survey findings and augment that with some of the things we heard from other people. So um, we started with familiarity with open science infrastructure and no surprise that of people responding to a SCOS survey, you know, nearly 90% said they had some familiarity, you know, so somewhat very or extremely familiar. 10% um, of them were extremely familiar and, and respondents based in Europe or North America were those most likely to be in the extremely or very familiar categories. Uh, those that were responding from institutions that pledge funds um, uh, were actually less likely to be extremely or very familiar with respondents from other organisations, which says something about how SCOS has been able to reach those who, who perhaps previously hadn't contributed funding. Um, familiarity with SCOS then, about 65%, so 89%, 90% were 
familiar with open science infrastructure, about 65% were somewhat very or extremely familiar with SCOS itself. Um, the only respondents who said they were extremely familiar with SCOS came from Europe or North America, and specifically Canada, France, the UK and the Netherlands were those saying they were extremely familiar and those countries and geographies were those, they also contributed a lot of respondents who were very familiar with SCOS. Um, we then asked us about familiarity with how SCOS operates itself. And here around 50% of respondents were somewhat very or extremely familiar with how SCOS operates. Um, the respondents from university libraries were likely, most likely to say they were not so familiar than any other response. And responses from pledging institutions were more likely, significantly more likely to express some familiarity with how SCOS operates than other respondents. Um, the only respondents who are extremely familiar with how SCOS operates were European, and uh, the not so familiar responses or not at all familiar responses were coming broadly, quite broad, but Asia and um, Africa and Oceania um, had a higher proportion than other geographies. 76% of respondents thought SCOS was somewhat very or extremely important as a source of support to open science infrastructure. Um, this was broadly represented across the globe. European respondents were more likely to say it was extremely important or somewhat important than other geographies who were all very saying it was very important. Um, when we asked about the effectiveness of SCOS, about 60% of respondents felt SCOS has been at least somewhat effective in sustaining open science infrastructure. And here we asked, um, we asked it in the surveys and in the focus groups for people for more diff for, for more details. So if if they had a particular view of SCOS, whether it was effective or not effective, we asked why, what they thought it was that made SCOS effective. And um, most people said when they were talking positively that SCOS has increased awareness, it's drawn more organisations into providing support for open science infrastructure, it's increased funding, it's increased the amount of funding by those who are providing support. So not just more funding, but those who are providing support are themselves giving more funding. Uh, open science infrastructure and non-commercially provided open science infrastructure is more visible and that by promoting the support of infrastructure globally, SCOS has helped promote interoperability between different providers and the confidence globally that that infrastructure is going to persist, you know, sort of challenging the myth that some of the not commercial providers or open providers are somehow higher risk. Um, when explaining why they hadn't given a more positive view or they'd said that SCOS was not effective, which I think only 1% of respondents did, um, people said that they felt that SCOS supporting infrastructure was still seen as a nice to have in budgets and therefore vulnerable to budget cuts. And that was something that they felt needed to be more addressed. Respondents um, highlighted a, a, a general sense that there was an imbalance in the geographic support through Scottish funding, that some areas were heavily represented in providing support and other areas were not, and that SCOS hadn't been able to deal with a free rider problem whereby some institutions could benefit but didn't provide support. You know, the idea that some people aren't aware of the, the fact that organisations providing the infrastructure need support or, or to provide funding and, and that that hasn't been fully addressed yet. There's a very strong belief that SCOS will be required for many years to come. And that was a really interesting finding because, you know, I think when we talk to people, uh, there's a general sense about SCOS that it's part of its value is just that it exists. So there have been lots of attempts to create initiatives to provide support to open science infrastructure. But SCOS is pragmatic. It exists. Funding has got out the door. It has supported an institution. Uh, institute, it's provided connections to support infrastructure. And... So it was a general question as to whether that need would still exist in years to come. And there's a very strong support that mainly that it will be needed for many years to come. Uh, some people saying for the next few years, but nobody responded to this question by saying that there would not be a need for SCOS um, for many years to come. We have a lot of data and insight from the surveys. Uh, and the one-to-one -one interviews. How does how do these results translate into our SCOS strategy? And perhaps maybe uh, Susan, you would like to pick that up. 
Uh, well, I think uh, what we've what we've we've been uh, buoyed by the results and uh, and have looked carefully at what it means for SCOS. And I, I think um, in as a way of summarizing, really, that uh, I, I think our, our strategy is um, is to keep going, <laughs> to continue um, uh, to evolve as needed, uh, to continue with outreach and communication to try to. Uh, even up the landscape of uh, the investment landscape a, a little bit more over time uh, to think about how we how we fit with others um, uh, the complementarity that we see between uh, SCOS, for example and IOI and and the different um, uh, ways that both uh, both can operate in this landscape and advance uh, advance uh, open infrastructure um, we are looking we will continue to to uh, add uh, uh, worthy infrastructure to the to those that are endorsed, and continue to uh, try to raise funds and 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 hone, I think, the the criteria and uh, and the governance, the the application process, and all of the processes involved. It's a it's a, a a strong and dedicated undertaking at this point, and and. Um, and so it's well set for for the next few years. So one of the SCOS goals is to have is to be global in reach, and to have global support from uh, the, for the selected infrastructure. And I was wondering how does the support look right now geographically, and are there any markets or kind of countries or locations that could do more? Um, Judy, I was wondering maybe you can answer this question. Sure, sure. Um, so you know. First, I think, uh, you know, we, we've got good data on this from the consultation and from SCOS itself, which is great. Um, I think there's a huge amount of enthusiasm right now um, for open infrastructure, which is, you know, accounts for the survey results around what's extremely important. Um, and I think one of the challenges that certainly we face in the U.S. Um, is just making sense of what those opportunities are. Um, so through our involvement with SCOS, the Association of Research Libraries can help do that. Um, CNI as an organization, as a conference, 100% um, does that, which is why we're so thrilled to be recording this for CNI audience. Um, and, you know, we do do such things in our con in our convenings, in our communities, our publications, etc. What we don't do, which is um, different from many of the member organizations and um, of SCOS is, is license on behalf of the, of the country. So the way the U.S. is, is organized is through um, in these decision making is through regional or peer or local consortia of libraries. And there are many of them, many of our members within ARL are members of more than one um, consortium. So it is, um, it is complicated, um, but we are seeing some, you know, uptake among those groups, the Big Ten Academic Alliance, for example, um, was, you know, contributed as a group to DOAJ, to DOAB, to OAPEN. Um, just yesterday, I think we saw the um, Ivy Plus libraries pledge their collective support for archive in 2022. Um, so again, I think the challenge is um, in evening this out um, is, is having is visibility and having under, which is part of the strategy, um, understanding what the opportunities are, knowing how to prioritize investments. Um, so I think, you know, again, SCOS needs more visibility in the US. Very happy. So again, happy to be here for CNI. Um, those decision makers um, in the US and consortia and individual libraries need data, which I'm really pleased that SCOS um, provides and collects and the SCOS infrastructures um, can, you know, can provide on a, on a geographic area in terms of usage. So, um, you know, in the round three funding, um, you know, two out of three of the resources are very familiar in the US, archive and DSpace, but Redelic um, has quite high usage by the research community. Um, so we, you know, we hope that through that in enhanced visibility, we see some enhanced um, contributions. Thanks, Judy. And I was wondering, Susan. Can I just add? Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I'm just very happy to add. I, I, I think um, the consortial model is an interesting one in this context, actually, and, and quite fruitful because what, what has happened in Canada, we're not a, a, a consortial licensing organization either, Carol, um, but there are consortia of course and because they're the cause the what has happened is that we have a uh, it's almost like a pick list of of different infrastructure that are then possible for individual 
uh, member institutions to opt into. Um, we have it on a more refined tier basis than the suggested uh, funds, uh, the suggested levels from SCOS itself uh, and from the infrastructure. So we 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 have an opt-in model that ends up being uh, uh, attractive to m members, and they can choose which which infrastructure they invest in and at what levels. There are tiers, um, so it's kind of rational. And um, and it, that is how we've broadened the reach. We had individual members initially that were individually engaging with SCOS. And when we went to uh, uh, sort of rolled it out in a consortial basis, it became much more uh, uh, more lucrative, really, for the for the fundraising because it was getting a smaller investment, but from many more institutions. And that is the beauty of a, of a consortial approach, where there is a, a 10 to 25 percent discount as well that is offered then by the infrastructure towards consortia. So really important, I think, that consortia uh, I think about uh, uh, the SCOS options and the SCOS recommended infrastructure. And I think what it means is that there's other countries as well that can be stepping up that 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 still are 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 considering um, how to how to orchestrate this. Um, some of them, France, for example, pools their funds. They they basically they have the individuals put the individual institutions put money towards a um, a fund, and then the fund allocates towards uh, towards infrastructure globally. So there's different models that can play out, and they're. Uh, there, uh, SCOS is a flexible approach. It was a flexible uh, model. I think that's what's great about SCOS as well is that I mean, there's no one fit all solution, and it depends on one country to another. What so what can work for Canada might not work for let's say in Qatar or other countries. Okay. But there's always a solution, and, and I guess the the pragmatism of the SCOS approach is what we're hoping kind of uh, works uh, all, all on the long term. Um, and I think, to, yeah. Awali, that goes back to one of your earlier questions about sustainability, which is SCOS is not just, SCOS is helping people to help themselves by creating those connections, by helping bring other people to the table and by enabling organizations to grow and be able to sustain something into the future. It's not just about writing a check and getting out the door because that actually doesn't address some of the challenges that, that these organizations face and as you say different things work in different places helping helping connect people at scale so they're not knocking on a thousand doors is as valuable as anything else that SCOS does and finding different ways to do it in different locations is, is extremely helpful. so maybe perhaps a, a question for the whole group um now we're towards the end of 2021 what can we expect from SCOS in the next year on the next years I mean, I'm happy to go first if, you know, I think somebody's already said it, but it's more of the same. It's doing something that's worked, doing something that's uh, successful for a larger group of organizations, some of who've been identified and going again, learning from the experience, because, you know, now there's a group of uh, supported infrastructures coming to the end of their cycle and their experience will be useful and SCOS will learn and change its application process and change some of its models to adapt to that. But I think in particular, thinking about the right mechanisms for supporting earlier stage or small organizations for whom the SCOS model is very challenging given the requirement in places to build connections and do that raising of funds and finding finding ways to, to help those organizations possibly in a slightly different way. I think those are the things that from conversation with people like Susan and Judy and yourself, those are the things that I'm interested in excited to see over the next. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think uh, continuing to um, raise the visibility of the resources and the mechanism and um, build the efficiencies of the fundraising model so that, you know, the sort of fewer links and easier er, easier opportunity for libraries that are members of different kinds of groups um, to make those contributions um, and to continue to provide decision makers with really rich data um, about usage and um, about the transformation of these resources themselves as they kind of engage with SCOS. I don't think I have anything to add aside from the fact that I think we are, we're looking to grow the stable and we're looking to uh, grow the reach, uh, the stable of infrastructure. Um, there's many parts to fit together. I think the type of organization that we're 
looking to support is is evolving a little bit and becoming more clear what what kind of organization it needs to be and i think we need to address the the kind of once it's transitioned you know then what because in point of fact i think that the, there is a sustained relationship between the between our individual institutions and some of these infrastructure that is appropriate and is what is ultimately sought and I know from conversations with Agatha, there's a lot of outreach activities going on. So maybe Agatha can tell us more about how can people find out more about SCOS and the latest news yes. and what's, what's going on. Yes, I will lead absolutely. So you all mentioned that we just barely launched the third pledging round uh, with, free, uh, with free infrastructure. So we have Archive, we have DSpace, and we have Redalic America. And what we learned uh, from past years is also that uh, potential pledgers or the community would like to hear about these infrastructures from the infrastructures themselves. So um, we ask them to, um, to work with us, together with us, and we will organize a series of webinars that will be focused on the third pledging round, where we will have representatives from each infrastructure telling the community what, what kind of sustainability issues, challenges they encounter, uh, how they would like to spend the money that hopefully we will raise for them. Um, and they will tell you a little bit more about how they operate on a day-to-day -day basis. What I think is quite crucial is what Judy mentioned uh, about usage. I know that, ple that pledging institutions are, are always very interested in the actual usage of the, of the services that, that they pledge for. So this is also something that we asked our free, free new infrastructures to, to provide to, to, our, um, to our future pledgers. So this is also something that they will be talking about in these upcoming webinars. For now, um, we have three of them confirmed. I will definitely um, give you some more specific dates, um, probably in January. We will start in January and we will go for three or four months so stay tuned. Uh, this will be definitely advertised uh, everywhere on the SCOS, uh, SCOS related uh, website, uh, Twitter account, and so on. Well, thanks, Agatha. And, th and thank you for everyone. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, John, for this uh, very lively and lovely conversation. And I'd like to thank our viewers for tuning in. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>